it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker. For 30 years, Taylor Branch has presented an unparalleled epic story of the civil rights movement and our democratic experiment. Tonight, Mr. Branch will talk about his life's work and the legacy of Martin Luther King. He is best known for his trilogy on the civil rights era, America in the King Years, the first book, Parting the Waters, America in the King Years, 1954 to 63, won the Pulitzer Prize and a number of other awards in 1989 when it was published. The two successive volumes, Pillar of Fire and At Canaan's Edge, remain in demand. All three of those books are on sale in our shop tonight. Uh, and in 2013, Mr. Branch published a compilation, The King Years, Historic Moments in the Civil Rights Movement. His 2009 memoir, The Clinton Tapes, Wrestling History with the President, chronicles an eight-year project to gather a sitting president's oral histories secretly on tape, not secret from the president, needless to say, um, but quietly and privately, the two of them worked together um, just that story it itself is um, quite a thrilling one. Uh, and I'm very pleased to remind some of you and let some of you know that in 2011, Taylor Branch was here at the Historical Society talking about that book and that experience and his experience with the Clintons. Um, and it has left a mark on my heart and soul uh, ever since I heard him give that talk. Um, in 2011, he also published an influential story for The Atlantic called The Shame of College Sports. At the time, NPR commentator Frank DeFord, may he rest in peace, um, said it may well be the most important article ever written about college sports. Um, at, this is a particular moment to think about that. Um, we have a little turmoil going on in that area right now. Uh, since 2005, under the executive director and very brilliant historian Lonnie Bunch uh, and the late chair John Hope Franklin, uh, Mr. Taylor has served as a member of the scholarly advisory committee of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which opened in 2016. And in 2018, he served as executive producer for the HBO documentary, King in the Wilderness. He has 12, 14 honorary doctoral degrees. I'm not sure I got them all when I tried to count. The Dayton Literary Peace Prize Lifetime Achievement Award and the National Humanities Medal. Uh, he is one of the most charming men I think I have ever met. So with that, Please join me in welcoming Taylor Branch to the stage. Well, good evening, Brooklyn. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. I'm here to talk about history. It seems appropriate at a historical society. Um, and I want to talk about history with a particular sense of urgency. If you agree that democracy being in retreat in some parts of the world, from Hungary and Poland, uh, across parts of Asia and, and South America, that it might also be shaky right here at home. If you think that is true and we don't take it for granted, I think you're wise, and I, what I want to do is to try to look at the civil rights movement for clues uh, about how to restore democracy and how to recognize th the seriousness of the situation that we're in uh, right now, because I think it's up to every citizen to do that, and that the clues are in our history, not just civil rights history, but in fact, the civil rights movement made history by looking at the history before it uh, and drew from the deepest wells in democracy to make it work. And we have a pretty dumbed down culture right now and I wanna try to work with you together to see if perhaps uh, we can find clues in there about how to revive us. Um, it's our task as citizens 
Uh, I want to begin, center it around two speeches. My, my central thesis is that if we understand the civil rights movement and Dr. King's movement properly, it's about the future, uh, not about the past. Um, everything about race tends to be discarded and minimized and, and, and put away such that when we celebrate Dr. King or the King's holiday and so forth, there's a tendency to say it's about a time when black people sat on the back of the bus and we don't have to worry about it and we can pat them on the head. Um, but in the sense that the civil rights movement served as modern founders for confronting systems of oppression and hierarchy and turning them towards equal citizenship, it is a model for what we need to do to restore our democracy. So I wanna, I wanna center it around two speeches that Dr. King gave only three months apart. They're not widely known. Uh, one is the Nobel Prize lecture, not the acceptance speech, but the lecture that he gave the next night. And the second one is his speech at Selma, uh, at the end of the third Selma march in March 1965. I'm talking about December 64 to March 1965. The Nobel lecture is not widely known. It's incredibly audacious. It says that he accepts the Nobel Prize despite the fact that the movement has not succeeded and the fact that it is imperiled at the time, but that he did want the world to recognize that he believed the freedom movement had, was spreading the widest liberation in human history and that it had done so by digging deep into the wells of democracy and it had come up with a method that he thought offered promise to deal with all three of mankind's ancient scourges, hatred, racial hatred, war, and poverty, which he called violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit. He said that the freedom movement had unlocked the tool of nonviolence, which was applicable to all of them, and that it proved over time that through nonviolence, you could understand why democracy could be both self-renewing and creative, because it was not making the problem worse. And he said, I know a lot of you think nonviolence is esoteric and strange. He didn't quite say he would joke about it in other times, saying that it's about vegetarians and Gandhians who won't step on insects, and, and that it's only very strange. And yet at the same time, he would say, if you take your religion seriously, no religion countenances violence, uh, at least in its creed. Um, uh, he would make fun of that too, saying that modern Christianity is against every war except the one we're in. Um, um, but he also said, if you believe in democracy, democracy is a cathedral of votes and every vote is nothing but a piece of nonviolence that depends on us to respect that nonviolence. So don't say that nonviolence is too oddball for you that, uh, that, that you believe in the army. Democracy is about nonviolence at its heart. So that's basically what he was saying. Now, what I want, a lot of you, most of you aren't as old as me, but a lot, some of you are, and most of you, <laughs> may remember at least back toward that era what he was talking about when he said the freedom movement was spreading the widest liberation in human history. How wide was it? It's easy to forget, my, and my argument is that it's easy forget, to forget precisely because it's about race and we tend to skim over and smooth over race to make ourselves more comfortable and we don't remember what it was about. But what he said was, number one, the civil rights movement is gonna liberate the white South, which is pathetically trapped economically, psychologically, and in every other way by segregation. And when we overcome and when we get rid of the civil rights bill, which we had just done, he said it will inevitably liberate the, civil, the, the South. Imagine if, if you would, what it would take to run the clock backwards and take all the major corporations that moved into the South, starting with the Atlanta Braves, which became the first professional sports team to move to the South the instant 
the, sec the Civil Rights Bill passed. All those corporations back out returned the South to the poverty region, to the hookworm belt, not the, su not the sun belt. Um, stigmatize all of its politicians, make them ineligible for national office. But that's only the beginning. Imagine what it would be like to expel both black people, students, and female students from the military academies. It was preposterous that they would be in the military academies when Dr. King made that speech. That was so far in the future, no visionaries even dreamed of it because they weren't even in the, in the Ivy League schools. And quite frankly, they weren't even in state universities. When I went to the University of North Carolina, the only females we had were nursing students. It was a gentleman's university by state law. We would have to expel every female rabbi and cantor in the United States because there had never been in 2,000 years of rabbinical Judaism until the civil rights movement got people the yeast in people's souls about what equal citizenship meant. That was preposterous too. We would have to undo all of these things. People don't remember that until 1966, it was illegal for females to serve on juries in about 13 states, and they were severely restricted in another 20 because it was considered too repugnant to their fine sensibilities to hear testimony in a courtroom about horrible crimes and things like that. You couldn't have Hoyt v. Florida was a Supreme Court decision that ratified Florida's law that said females in Florida could serve on juries, but they had they wouldn't be on the jury pool unless they went down to the courthouse and affirmatively asked to be considered and gave an affidavit that it would not interfere with their homemaking duties. <laughs> this is the world we lived in. We would have to eliminate women and black faces from the media, most professions. Title IX, by the way, which you hear about in sports. Um, it was vilified in the Reagan administration as the Lesbian's Bill of Rights. Uh, but it passed. It was not about sports. It was about opening up graduate schools for professions that had long been limited to men. We would have to restore all of that. We would have to restore a world that is so far removed from the world that we take for granted that we would begin to understand what he meant by widest liberation. He was talking about not only the fact that most of the colonial world was being liberated from a century, actually more than centuries, of colonial rule that we're still dealing with in our foreign policy, the af aftermath of that, but at least the colonialism was retreating uh, uh, around the world. So yes, I argue that it is a wide liberation, and we don't really remember that. And in fact, it's even wider than that, because beyond the imagination of female rabbis and women at West Point, It is the world that we take for granted today for gays and lesbians whose behavior was not only legal. The idea of marriage equality was so far from reality then that I know of no visionary that talked about it that early. The word gay wasn't even in common usage. But once people started struggling over equal citizenship across the divisions of race, it made it easy to apply them for things that were visionary that we now take for granted. Gays and lesbians in those days were, first of all, criminalized, deeply in the closet, and their world was very much like the cross-racial world that I grew up in Atlanta, which is an audience that had any of the mix that we have here would have everybody's palms clammy for fear that, our, that something would happen, that we were in it. And we, we can't imagine what that was like, that, that, that those divisions um, were so fearful that people were on pins and needles in any kind of uh, cross-cultural context. So that's the liberation that he said was being spread on the 
by this movement founded in nonviolence that he said not only could restore democracy and, and spread liberation and democracy, but could deal with the ancient scourges of racism, poverty, and war. Now, he gave this lecture in Oslo in December 1964, and all of his staff said, this is really great, we got the Nobel Prize, it's taken us 10 years since the Brown decision, but we finally at least dealt with segregation. We should dine out on that for about 20 years of chicken dinners and, and honorary degrees. And King said, no, um, the mountaintop is fine, but the valley is calling me. And he dragged his staff from Oslo to Selma. And he was in jail within a month in the, in the Selma movement. The rest of his career, the last three years, which is what we dealt with in the uh, documentary, King in the Wilderness, last year, shows a much more driven Martin Luther King knowing that time was against him for reasons that I'm about to get to, saying I, we want to leave a witness even though the politics of the time are turning against us. We've set this thing, and he dragged them to Selma to say we've got to deal with the vote. Then he dragged them to the north to say we have a limited time to show that race in America is not and never has been just about the South. And he exposed race, racial hatred in Chicago that he said was as bad or worse than any he had ever seen in Mississippi. Then, over the all but unanimous vote of his staff, he attacked the Vietnam War in the Riverside Church. Uh, and in one of his greatest speeches, saying, I don't begrudge anybody's anti-communism, but if you really believe in democracy, the way, to make dem the way to defeat communism is to show that you have the best form of government and that freedom is, is, the, is the best system uh, for the world. If you think you can spread democracy by violence, you do not understand democracy. That's basically what he said uh, at the Riverside Church. And then finally, just when the staff was beginning to get over that, Many of them wanted to go back to the South. They didn't want to be in the North. They didn't want to do Vietnam, which turned a lot of the civil rights movement and black leaders against them. Um, he said he wanted to have a poor people's campaign. Modeled on the bonus marchers, by the way, from the 1930s, who, who came to Washington during the Depression and camped out, and the Army drove them out. Colonel Patton and Colonel MacArthur drove them out, killed several of them. It was, a, it was a, a debacle. And yet, Dr. King said, the agitation that that, that, that set off over what the country might do for, for soldiers of freedom planted the seeds for the GI Bill, which he said was the greatest act of, 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 of a functioning democracy to, to, to create the middle class in history. And he said, our poor people's campaign, if we do it right, might lay seeds for generations beyond us. So that's what he was doing. But Selma was a huge breakthrough, the last great big breakthrough in, in the civil rights movement. One that Lyndon Johnson recognized in a speech that's famous because he said we shall overcome, but it should be more famous because of the very beginning of it when he said there are certain moments that go to the very heart of America. So it was at at uh, Concord and Lexington, so it was at Appomattox, and so it was last week in Selma. And he, he equated an all-black nonviolent march for voting rights in Selma with the pioneers of original American democracy in all of its crises, the Revolution and the Civil War, where race is always um, at the center of those things when they, when they come to the fore. So King, a few days later, they, they get to Montgomery, and he gives a speech. They had to mangle it in uh, Ava DuVernay's movie uh, for fear of copyright, which is a nitty-gritty issue that we won't get into. Instead of saying, how long, not long, uh, they said, soon, it will be soon, or something like that. <laughs> they lost all his music. But, but the music of that speech was that that we were addressing something at the very heart of democracy, which was the right to vote for the Voting Rights Act. Um, may it be restored. Um, 
But the part of the speech that I want to call to your attention tonight is almost entirely lost because he gave a pretty long speech there. It's about 45 minutes. And what he said was, this is a pinnacle moment, but I want you to look at history and recognize that there is already a danger that when America sets goals and makes landmarks to deal with the true issues of democracy across the races that divide us, forces set in that go in the opposite direction. He said, I want to direct your attention to 1865. A hundred years ago, we dealt with race in the only crisis where we didn't even acknowledge an election. We had a war instead. Uh, and betrayed the most hopeful tradition in America for the Civil War. And after it, we passed three constitutional amendments to deal with the aftermath of slavery in four years. And we forgot every single one of them. The 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and he argued even the 13th Amendment because of peonage and convict labor and a whole bunch of other things that we swept under the rug. But we certainly swept under the rug the 15th Amendment that guaranteed the right to vote and pretended that we still respected our Constitution. He said that shows the power of forgetfulness to sweep our politics under the rug and distort the memory of what we've done. He said, you know, the segregation laws didn't come right out of slavery. The segregation laws came later. We resegregated and forgot we did it and, and, and pretended that it was compatible with the Constitution. And, and things like that lived all the way up, of course, until after World War II. And, and we're continuing to live. So what he was saying is that American politics will react against this in ways that make should make us vigilant that we can never relax about the, the, duty, the deep wells of democracy and digging there and understanding them and, and recognizing the citizens' duty to protect and advance them. He had already given a speech. This is not as big a speech, but to me, it, it may be more of a, an illuminating speech to illuminate what he meant by the warning that American history shows that the American people have a capacity to deal under, in crisis with, with race and democracy and what it means, but they also have a capacity to forget that and, and to find ways to channel and sublimate that hostility in, in ways that will undermine it and have history go backwards. And he cited George Wallace. He said, George Wallace, before he ran for president in 1964, the previous year, completely redid his standard stump speech. The apostle of segregation, the most virulent racist in American politics, expunged race from his stump speech, and in fact said that he had never denigrated any person in America on behalf of their race. And he said that his only goal and the reason he was running for politics and the reason that he believed that at least one party and maybe both would adopt this agenda, that his goal was to restore local politics from the centralized tyranny of tax and spend liberals, big government, and tyrannical judges. And his speech invented the vocabulary of modern politics. And King said, I recognize these are minor little classics and the warning for you is, as preposterous as that is, out of the mouth of George Wallace, people will believe it because they don't want anybody to think that they're a racist. They, they, everybody wants the benefit of the doubt. And it was only one year later after that, Ronald Reagan, running for governor of California, was asked at a public event, why did he oppose both the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965? And he exploded and said, I do not have a race, racist body, bone in my body. I will not listen to this. He walked out, and he was never asked that question again. People want to give people a pass because we are accustomed to the most superficial conversations about race and having consequential things, retreats 
put in motion, and then excusing them as something else. I mean, even in a trivial sense, from my world of sports, I'm not here to talk about sports tonight, but in 1966, by the way, speaking of sports, that was another thing about the widest liberation in history. Sports were basically all white then. College, the University of Texas won the National Football Championship in 1969 with a, a roster of 85 players, all white. Even sports were still segregated. Uh, so the liberation was going in there. But in 1966, Adolph Rupp's dominant Kentucky Wildcats lost to Texas El Paso. Uh, UTEP to an all-black team that dunked. <laughs> Adolph Rupp was on the, on the rules committee of the NCAA, and for eight years, from 1968 to 1976, college basketball outlawed the dunk shot. <laughs> now, nobody remembers this. People don't remember it. It is too deeply racial. And, and not only that, they swallow the excuse that it was about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, because of one player who was over seven feet tall. There have been plenty of players, you know, Wilt Chamberlain, on and on. But it was because Rupp did that that he did not want his all-white teams to be humiliated by black players who could dunk, even when they were shorter than they were. <laughs> and, and the dunk shot was outlawed from 1968 to 1976, not only in games, but in warm-ups. If you dunked in a warm-up, the game started with the other team shooting free throws. We don't remember that because it shows the galling, almost humorous, pernicious nature of race, how deeply it is under our skin. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a capacity to trivialize race and to be skittish about it that the people who've been taking George Wallace to heart and using that vocabulary against government to the point that it gets, it's corrosive, it opposes government at every turn, at least that part of government that, that's, that's about we the people, that, 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 that is beyond, say, Genghis Khan's government, you know, military and that sort of thing. All of the democratic aspirations of government are vilified you don't have to have an idea to be in politics, you just have to cuss government that's telling you that we might have to work together across the lines that divide us. So you have hostile, dumbed down politics that win elections. The quintessence of that is Trump because after 50 years, it's kind of almost run its course and, I, and the electorate knows that we've gotta do something more positive and so I think he's having to bring out into the open the things that have been uh, implicit for a long time, which puts us at a crisis point. We're either going to have another movement to recognize that we have to restore and respect our democratic rights, or we're going to risk continued corrosion in our respect for the basic institutions of democracy. I mean, I don't know about you, He's attacked and, and, and denigrated a lot of institutions, the FBI and so on and so forth. But when he said the other day that I've got the Army and I've got the police forces and I've got the motorcycle clubs, and if we don't win our elections, they're going to be unhappy, he's threatening the voters. Now, that deserves more because that's the institution that we take for granted the most, that we pay attention to elections, how, how, however great our divides are. There is no issue in American politics of any seriousness for which race is not at the heart. I don't care whether you're talking about taxes, guns, immigration, um, apportionment, gerrymandering, it's, it's all about race, but we deal about race by, in an emergency situation. Something happens that is so egregious, somebody being shot, somebody being killed, that we deal with it and it's a crisis and it interferes with regular politics just long enough for people to address that and say we're in a crisis and then they go back to regular politics. If we were a mature country, we would recognize that 
in order to address any of these issues, we have to be co comfortable talking about the place that race plays in them, including guns, including the Second Amendment. Our history is so superficial that people have no sense at all where the Second Amendment came from. The Second Amendment did not, I'm writing about this now and, I, and, and I, I can't prove it every degree, but if you read the Second Amendment, um, a well-regulated militia being a, a, a essential to public order, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Nobody cared about militias. You can't find a historian. George Washington cussed the militias one, up one side and down the other. He didn't want any militia troops because they were drinking clubs. And, and, their and their arms were stashed in armories and they would come out and have drinks. They were worthless. Nobody would secure their rights in the Constitution. But was, what was not a joke were the slave patrols, which were the distinctive security institution for slavery for over 200 years. We don't think about that because we want to have a nice sunny view of that. How do you think slavery existed for 200 years when you've got lots of people out in the countryside uh, surrounded by slaves and you've got women and children there? They had to know that there was a, deputa a deputized body of, of, of white men who, that's why there's so many colonels and majors in the South. It's an honorary term for the people who served on the slave patrols. What I'm arguing is that it's at least as plausible that the Second Amendment was put in there to, to appease the anti-federalists who were worried that the federal government could take their slaves, as that makes a lot more sense than the notice, notion that they put in the Second Amendment so that everybody could be confident that nobody was going to steal their squirrel gun. And now we've, we have translated that through the same kind of euphemistic race suppressing um, politics to think, to allow people to run around saying that American democracy can't, can't protect me and I need my AK-47 to go into Starbucks. So these are the kinds, these are the kinds of things that to me illustrate that, that, that we have accepted euphemism for serious discussion, and, and we have drifted away from what Dr. King did. He said, our movement has to go into the deep wells of democracy, because that's our only hope to, to, to deal with, to heal, to redeem. What he said, we want to redeem the soul of, of America and American democracy by using its own tools, because that's all we had. And, and the first place he went was into the, into the revolution, into Madison, really. Madison said democracy is pre preposterous. It hadn't existed for 2,000 years. Only a profound meditation on human nature can give us any hope. And he came up with two things. Forget all the stuff about checks and balances and so on and so forth. That's important. But underneath it, if you read the Federalist Papers, he said it's a psychological bet against the grain of history, which is about rulers who trust their army and want to discipline others to say we can form a government that says people can govern themselves and build up public trust. That, that is the psychological premise. And Dr. King said that is the premise of our movement. Nobody has more self-discipline and more public trust than a freedom rider who looks at a Klansman who's about to hit him and say, you can hit me, I won't hit you, and it may not change your heart, but it's going to change your children's heart or your grandchild's heart. And that this kind of patriotism um, was the intellectual basis for reaching deep into the wells of democracy. But Dr. King later said, look, that's an idea. It, it won't work just as an idea. He tried to preach America out of, out of segregation, and it didn't work. He, he recognized with the sit-in students that human nature is so stubborn that there are some places where you have to, you have to advance 
beyond those deep well arguments and, and premises for democracy by sacrifice and personal witness. It's up to the citizens. That's where the Freedom Riders came from. That's where the children came from who marched into dogs and fire hoses. Um, and lastly, he said, you have to have an irrational belief in nonviolence because nonviolence is not a popular word. It was the most powerful idea in the movement, but the first one to become passe and that people don't really talk about, don't really understand. But he, he, he said, you have to have belief that we can be self-governing, that we can build public trust in spite of all the evidence to the contrary if our citizens are willing to sacrifice for it and if our c citizens are willing to maintain the irrational hope that democracy can succeed in a world that's where it's still surrounded by dictators and sultans and Saudi Arabia, for God's sake, and Putin oh, and all of these places. Democracy, we have to recognize, is still relatively young. It was con most people who, who have drawn breath on this earth think of it as preposterous. In fact, they never even considered it. It was only a century ago at the funeral of Edward VII in, in England that there were about 75 monarchs r rode in on horseback, sultans and kings and so on and so forth, for all over the world, representatives from China and stuff. And then behind them were women, queens and stuff, in carriages. And then way back at the back, they had Teddy Roosevelt in a car as, a, as the Republican representative. So only a century ago, the world was canopied with, with kings and sultans and dictators and stuff. We're still a little isolated. We should never take it for granted. And what I'm trying to say is that the civil rights movement is the best example of how you reach into the deep wells for something to confront. Um, uh, the challenge of democracy, and that if we're serious about it, we can move our dialogue forward from really a truncated, dead-end conversation between racists and non-racists. Nobody has a conversation where you start off saying, you're a racist, and the, and the other one says, no, I'm not a racist. Where does that conversation go? The best scholars that I know writing against racism call themselves anti-racists. Anti-racism is, is a very, very limited concept. How far can you get? What we really need is a positive matrix. How interracial is your understanding of the culture that is establishing democracy in the United States and being the example for democracy around the world? We have a lot to be proud of. We have, we have communities from all over the world living here. Go to a naturalization ceremony sometime. Um, they're unbelievable. Uh, we do have a lot to commend us, but we are a lot more, our lives, our, where we live, who we have dinner with, uh, our lives are much more segmented than, than we like to think. We need to acknowledge that because the other side is, is basically betting that the people who used to be called liberals, but because that was too too associated with the civil rights movement decided to call themselves progressive so that they wouldn't be accused of being, you no, know, they were skittish about exposure, losing elections on race. We have to get over that and say, when we deal with race, good things happen for everybody, B beginning with the fact that we understand and can really wrestle with the deep wells of democracy. And it would be positive, and, and it should be positive, and um, my first practical recommendation is that every public debate, every public session about politics should end or begin where I'm going to end now um, with a recitation. It's only one sentence, but like King's Nobel Prize address on the audacity of the freedom movement to want to liberate the world and spread the widest liberation in history. If you listen to these phrases written by slaveholders, it's very hard to be cynical about government. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, 
ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. If everybody started there, we'd be better, and we would understand that race has always been the original sin, but also the original promise for deepening our understanding uh, uh, of, of where democracy can stand in the world. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions on anything, um, not, all, not just highfalutin stuff. But I, I, I wanted to try to, you're a historical society, I wanted to try to put the challenges before us that are on the same plane with, I think, is the, is the depth of the crisis that we face. So forgive me for, uh, for uh, a lot of ideas and not as many stories as I usually do. This is a very small question. What, would you care to comment on Bayard Rustin's role in accomplishing what Dr. King accomplished? Good question. Well, Bayard is an amazing character. I, I, I spent a lot of time interviewing him. Uh, it was a privilege to do that. Um, that's why I'm glad I started when I did. I missed a few people. They had already died. So. Um, but I did get to spend a good, you know, it's a, it's a complex story. He, he, was, he was erudite, he was brave beyond measure, he was wise, he was also conflicted. Um, uh, you know, he was persecuted, he was black, blackmailed, um, Adam Clayton Powell, but this, this were all politics in the, black, in the world of black preachers. And um, uh, so Bayard was victimized at, for, at times, and he came back. One of, my <laughs> one of my best interviews with him was about the March on Washington, because the March on Washington, of course, rehabilitated him. He had been in exile because of Adam Clayton Powell and, and, and Dr. King, much against his will, um, um, allowed Bayard to, to, to not be one of his advisors to retreat. There was tremendous Cold War politics going on here. This is Hoover, this is wiretaps, this is you're vulnerable, this is Kennedy saying they'll blackmail us, uh, so on and so forth. There's, there was a lot going on, but anyway, Bayard launched this comeback after basically being in exile from 60 to 63. But before that, you know, he went to jail any number of times, he went to Africa, he, uh, he, he, he crusaded on any number of issues. He was also a fabulous musician, a world-class art collector. I mean, um, but he's in exile. And Dr. King and A. Philip Randolph basically um, stood up to Roy Wilkins and uh, others who did not want him to have anything to do with the March on Washington. And he basically was the behind-the-scenes organizer. And um, people forget that when the March on Washington occurred, the country was absolutely on pins and needles, and the news media, wildly different from today's 24-7 news media, but the news media was on pins and needles um, in the conviction that you could not bring several hundred thousand black people to Washington without there being a bloodbath. There were paratroopers uh, uh, posted all around the city, um, they, they, they cut off alcohol sales, they stockpiled plasma, they had the courts ready to deal with um, uh, uh, dragnet arrests all night. Um, this, this was, and, and to me, the most serious thing, you know what it takes to cancel a Major League Baseball game in advance? <laughs> Major League Baseball canceled two games, the day of the march and the next day, in advance, on the assumption that we would still be cleaning up the blood 
uh, in Washington, D.C. The Washington Senators had two games. They were canceled in advance. That's how scared people were. That's how, uh, I'm talking about pins and needles, the pins and needles culture. Then all of a sudden you have the March on Washington, which is the only mass meeting, the mass meeting being the distinctive cultural institution of a civil rights movement that didn't have its own banks and its own TV stations and its own, it had the mass meeting in a church. Well, this was a giant mass meeting. It's the only one that was televised and, and its spirit came through and everybody said, wow, this isn't so bad. So Byard, <laughs> Byard told me that when this was over, they put him on the cover of Life magazine. <laughs> and he said, all the reporters knew that I had been a communist, that I was a, that I, I, you know, that I was a bastard, that I thought my mother was my grandmother, uh, that I was, that I was a draft dodger, that I had gone to jail instead of World War II. They knew that I was a pariah by every standard. And he didn't say gay, but that was there too. That I was a pariah by every standard. And he said, he confronted them at a press conference and he said, I know why you put me on the cover and why you're now saying that I'm a genius. It's because you're embarrassed that you so misgaged the nature of this march and I allowed you by putting me up there saying, yes, there would have been a bloodbath with these dark hordes, except this genius, Byron Rustin, put porta potties all along, all along the mall and made those Negroes nice enough for tea. Um, that's Byard. He had a sense uh, of himself. He was re rehabilitated. Um, and for a couple of years, he was, he was a major central strategist. But there was conflict again over Vietnam, you know, because he went to work for the AFL-CIO. And Byard, after a lifetime of pacifism, basically criticized Martin Luther King. He was one of the ones, believe it or not, who criticized Martin Luther King for taking on the Vietnam War because he said it's undermining the, basically the great society politics that are really about the nuts and bolts that we've never had before. So it's, it's an amazing story. It's, 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 a, it's a romantic story, but there are elements of tragedy in it. I'm sorry. Uh, he's such a fascinating figure. If you'd asked me an easier one, I'd have given a shorter answer. Yes, sir. <laughs> What if question? Mm -hmm. If Martin Luther King had not been assassinated, how in broad strokes do you think our history here in the United States would have been different over these past 55 years? Mm. That's another easy one. Yeah. Um, well, of course, that's an impossible question, and it's going to take longer, but I'm going to give a shorter answer. Um, I, I think it's hard for us easy not to notice that he was a widely marginalized figure by the end of his life. He was not on the front pages. Uh, it was not, I mean, he was denigrated by the left, um, by the black power movement, and certainly by the major news media. Uh, nobody was looking forward to his poor people's campaign, um, which was denounced by everybody. So my theory, and this is wild speculation that I shouldn't do. I think he was headed towards some kind of uh, breakdown um, physically. Um, he, he, he burned the candle f for way too long. He would have had some kind of retreat. And quite frankly, I think that he would have emerged, at least for a time, as a spokesperson for the international movement the fact that nonviolence surprisingly went outside the United States. Um, solidarity in Poland. Um, we shall overcome that the Berlin Wall, uh, doing miracle, Nelson Mandela, um, that, 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 that the spirit of the movement, the liberation that he was talking about, really the spirit of the civil rights movement went outside the United States, and I think he would have recognized that and tried to say, we need to take counsel from our, with our own inspiration and try to, so, so I think he would have been, been more of an international voice. Uh, beyond that, I, I really don't know, and even that is, is kind of a guess. Yes, ma'am. 
I was particularly taken back about your comment about progressivism versus liberalism and how progressivism is kind of a way to hide behind or not deal with racism. So I'd like to hear you expand about that a little bit more. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a simple, small thing about words that liberals, liberals were battered at the end of the civil rights movement from both ends. Radicals said that they were milk toasty and, and conservatives said that liberals had forced the civil rights movement down their throats. So liberals were under siege because they were identified with, 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 a, with a movement that had race at its center, okay? And, and it wasn't very long after that that Democrats uh, starting to win uh, running in elections kind of distanced themselves for that, from, from, from that in order to win election. And so, so words, to me, words do matter and vocabulary matters and, and the fact that liberalism disappeared from public discourse. You can hard, conservatives make a mantra of conservative. They say conservative time after time after time, um, which by the way they did also after the Civil War. Um, it was the conservative parties that over, overthrew Reconstruction. In fact, the Democratic Party in most of the South when they were overthrowing Reconstruction called themselves the Democratic Conservative Party. And it had a double meaning because it meant we're conservative in the sense that we want to we want to restore as much of the old South as we can, but that we're cautious we're not going to start another civil war. Um, so th that was very useful. The fact that you find you hardly ever hear anybody use the word liberal; they all speak of progressive. Look, the Progressive Party at the beginning of the 20th century were people, both Republicans and Democrats, who had a progressive agenda precisely because they had eliminated black people from politics. That was the only way they had done it, and they called themselves progressive. And I'm just saying, I think that it is telling that you have a hard time finding anybody to, liberal and conservative is, is, is I mean, it's, it's not an ideological litmus test, it's, it's logic, you know, it's, it, and there are good things about liberals and conservatives, but the fact that you can't get liberals to say that they're liberal makes me suspect that a progressive is a liberal who doesn't want to talk about race. <laughs> yes, sir. No, to, to, for you to get back to what you were talking about, just essentially for the civil rights movement and its place um, for, for us at this point, point in time to look back, um, I'm curious if you feel as though that in discussions about liberation or identity politics or any number of, of things that go on in this day and age that we don't think enough about the civil rights movement, that, that, that it has been put into a place of you know, Martin Luther King's speech and the March on Washington and that's that, and that the essence of it is, is, is either forgotten or, or misunderstood. Yes, that's... that's a lot of what I was trying to say, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying that our history shows a pattern of convenient forgetfulness about race um, that, that undermines our appreciation for what it's doing and that a proper, to me, a proper understanding of the civil rights movement is important precisely because you would see that these are people arguing all night about what they can draw out of the wells of democracy that will enable people to understand the point that they're trying to make. Uh, and I'm not talking just about Martin Luther King, I'm talking about SNCC students and, and Nation of Islam people and Malcolm X, they're arguing all night about, you know, fundamentals. And we're stuck in gossip, you know, by and large, spitballs and gossip. And um, so in that sense, I think, I think it's really a, a, a model that, um, that, we, that we need going forward. That's why my main point was um, at our peril, we see it as just a, something about the past that doesn't apply to the future anymore. Um, I've uh, seen King in the Wilderness several times and oh. deeply appreciate, I learned so much from that and really Thank appreciate you. that. Um, I'm curious, I hear a a kind of desperation in your voice when you're talking, and I'm, I'm, um, perhaps I'm, I'm channeling some of that. But I'm wondering, are you surprised by where we are now as a country, given given 
all that you've written about and learned about and, and watched? Yes and no. I mean, I, I, ever since I, I started studying this and seeing all these clues from Dr. King that it's a recurrent pattern that we deceive ourselves uh, about the role that race plays in the wake of a racial crisis. I mean, that our history books today call the overthrow of Reconstruction by terror, the largest terror campaign in history. The official word for that in history textbooks is redemption, okay? That shows the lengths to which we can deceive ourselves ab about the role of race. I knew that it was going on, um, and I've spoken about this before. But I, but I also, and I keep saying, I, you know, I hope we're at a cycle where people, history goes in cycles, where people um, begin to recognize it. Um, but, but I do think that the combination of the erosion of democratic values in countries in, in Europe and in Eastern Europe um, and, and, the, and the links that, to which Trump has gone in denigrating democratic institutions um, reminds me that there is no natural, cycles don't happen just automatically. They only happen because people make them happen. And, and um, therefore, I really, I really think that it's up to us. And when I saw that thing about, you know, I've got the army and the police and the motorcycle clubs, to me, I, this is somebody in, our, in the highest office basically threatening the voters, vote for me or else. Um, and we haven't had that. I mean, to, to me, that, that is an existential threat to democracy beyond um, anything George, Washington, George Wallace ever dreamed up. Yes, sir? I'm interested in your view of the uh, reparations movement. Would you care to comment on that? Yes. Reparations means repair. We are by no means repaired. A, a debate about what repair means, um, um, it, it, it seems to me could, could, could go at, at a very minimum to where we live, how our justice policies work, what we've done, uh, in, in prisons, economic opportunity, education, uh, on and on. Um, it, is, it is oversimplified into a, a, a demand for every white person to write a check to every black person, um, and that that's not likely to happen. Um, precisely, I think, to avoid the true meaning of the word reparation, meaning repair. Um, to me, it's just a shorthand for acknowledging the, the depth uh, of the damage that our racial history uh, st that lives on today. So I'm for the reparations movement because I think that it is serious discussion rather than just bouncing off. We bounce off race. Uh, and um, and, and that, that's, that's what's dangerous. I don't have a formula for reparation, I'm not. So uh, I'm in high school and I was wondering, you were talking about how it's a crisis and the cycle, it's getting worse, right? So right now we're at like the low point and um, uh, we need to bring it up. So, okay, sorry. Um, so I was wondering, um, right now there's videos that are going around in high schools, public and private, of kids in blackface, you know, they're, they have like young kids in blackface, they jump around, act like monkeys, like they pretend to be black, and then there's a whole epidemic of kids saying the N-word. Um, and so I was just wondering, I mean, obviously I wasn't alive when the civil rights uh, movement happened, but if it's starting so young in like a place, even like New York, what would you, what would you like do to try to, um, I don't know, kickstart a movement again, so, something similar? Well, first of all, thank you. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm not on those social, I wouldn't even know how to find those social media channels. So um, that's, that's sad and distressing that it's happened. I think some of that may be imitative and, and, and uh, may not be as serious as it sounds. <laughs> 
Um, but the very fact that it's happening is, is, is alarming. And there's a lot of support for it in, in, in the culture. I mean, goodness gracious, we've had, we've had white supremacist militias for, for a long time. I mean, when I was doing the Clinton thing here in, in 2011, we were looking back to 1994 when Timothy McVeigh blew up the Oklahoma City Federal Building. Uh, the largest act of terrorism uh, before 9-11, killed all of those people, saying that it was because he was anti-FBI. The Republican Congress held hearings that year, the next year, uh, when they took over Congress, not on the threat of Timothy McVeigh and white supremacist groups, but on the threat of the FBI. Um, so we have a capacity to, to blind ourselves to, to um, um, the, the white supremacist movements uh, that are going on. I don't really know what to say about high school kids, except there are so many um, positive stories in high school. And I know, I know just from my own experience, and maybe it's, it's certainly not definitive, but there are an awful lot, awful lot of young people uh, who are more comfortable dealing interracially than their elders uh, in, in this culture. And I think we have to look uh, to them for, for hope and leadership. Yes, sir? How do you teach kids about the true history, the foundation? Uh, Ken Burns said that racism is the real curse of this country. How can, I learned, you know, that George Washington cut down the cherry tree. That's a myth. So if I could learn that, why can't we teach the truth? Is that possible? And I mean starting at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Young people. I think that's a, um, the Gilder Lerman uh, Foundation here in New York sent me around the country a few years ago talking to high school history teachers. It's the reason I did the little book there dedicated to students of freedom and teachers of history. Um, because what I found consistently was that high school history teachers are besieged. They don't have good material uh, to give to their students. And if they're a good high school history teacher, they're, they're getting pressured by their principal subtly to teach English instead of history because the schools are graded on history and they're not, they're not graded on, you know, they're graded on English and math, reading and math, and they're not graded on history. And we've taken out the arts and humanities and our history. We stopped teaching civics a long time ago. History is the only place you can kind of get civics by osmosis. Uh, now and now it's it's in retreat to me that's one of the most uh, alarming things uh, 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 about the future yes I think young people are inherently not as biased and bigoted as they were they're growing up in a better world but they're not getting a better education about anything close to the fundamentals of democracy and what the story is and high school history the the humanities and in particular history <coughs> I don't want to say that because I think music and art, uh, all the things in school that teach young people how to relate to one another um, are, are being sacrificed to the things that people can do alone uh, and, and learn alone. And I think that that's really dangerous in our educational system. And um, so, I mean, dangerous for not only for our education, but dangerous for our sense of, of community and citizenship. So I don't, have any, I don't have any easy answer for that, and, and, and it's certainly not Betsy DeVos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, King was also uh, a religious leader and a religious thinker. Uh, since that time, the culture has become much more secular. The extent that religious involvement in public life is, is more conservative and frankly negative. What do you see as the prospects of religion playing a more constructive role in our That's almost to me like the liberal and progressive question. It's when it's it's when church people in this true spirit of religion choose to stand up again. We have plenty of religious influence in our politics. It's just it's all on the right. <laughs>
uh, religious right people pretending that they're being religious. Um, um, so, so that's really, but you know, one of the great gifts that King had was that he talked about religion and politics every day and had many enemies, and yet I can't find a single play example in the record where he was attacked for mixing church and state. Not one. And he was attacked for plenty of things, but not that. And the reason to me is that he, one of his great gifts was that he, he had a his rhetoric, if you study his rhetoric, it was incredibly balanced. He would put one foot in the Constitution and one foot in the Scripture, and he wouldn't sub he would say either way, equal souls or equal votes. Whatever your, these, these root premises, our root, rooted beliefs are compatible with one another. I'm not trying to drive religion out of politics or, or dominate politics with my religion. Take your pick, equal souls or equal votes. So he would have these phrases, you know, one day... Um, the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for the, for the best of the American dream and the most sacred uh, Judeo-Christian values. So he would just, he did that, and, and that was a gift. Uh, but it allowed him to, to talk about a spiritual base um, in an honest way um, that, that I think is healthy. You know, I... In America, if you are anti-religious, you have a hard time assembling a majority. You have, to under, you have to recognize that. To me, what's amazing is that the religious right gets away with people conceding that they're religious when I don't see any religion coming out of them. Um, so, but you, you did feel it coming out of Martin Luther King. Um, what? The other thing about Martin Luther King is that what's most distinctive about his oratory, I mean, that balance may be the most distinctive thing, but to me the most distinctive, the second most distinctive thing is that it's the timbre of his voice more than the content of his words that you feel because you know that there's kind of a furnace in there, that he's not a Pollyanna, that he knows how grim the tides of race have been. I mean, he spoke at, he spoke at a memorial service for somebody who was executed in, in Montgomery for stealing $2.57. He knew, he knew how grim things were, and yet he, he offered hope. So you see those things colliding in him. And, and that war between realism, realism and optimism it, it gives the distinctive timber to his voice that, that, that I think amplifies the, um, the wonderful balance of his words. Um, I haven't heard many of the religious right figures give speeches on what the religious basis uh, they have is. Um, but it, it, it's, it's really sad that they, get, that they get away with being the voices for what passes for the voices of religion uh, in modern culture. We have time for one last question over here. Thank you. If you could talk a little bit about um, the relationship between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King in the last six months of Malcolm X's life, when in fact uh, he had made contact with Martin Luther King, and uh, Martin Luther King was going to support a petition campaign at the United Nations uh, that Malcolm X was initiating along with members of the African unity. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about that and what you think might have come to pass if Malcolm X hadn't been assassinated. Well, I, I really think there's a lot we still don't know about Malcolm's life. Um, I, I, my middle volume, Pillar of Fire, has a lot about, uh, about Malcolm's um, last three years and what was going on with him, between him and Elijah Muhammad and him and Wallace Muhammad, uh, Elijah Muhammad's son. I spent a good deal of time with Wallace Muhammad, who I think is the most underrated uh, religious figure of the 20th century. Um, I do think that 
our history of Malcolm is unbalanced because nobody really takes seriously Malcolm's religion. Uh, and I do think that it was serious. And people tend to say, oh my God, he didn't know that there were white people in Islam and so on and so forth until he, until he made his hajj. That is nonsense. Malcolm, Malcolm was shrewd. He knew everything about what was going on there. He was in an internal struggle trying to implant Islam in North America using the phony doctrines as bait, you know, uh, the stuff that weren't, the doctrines that weren't part of uh, of true Islam, but trying to outgrow it. And the problem is that those phony doctrines allowed the nation of Islam to be corrupted by money and power and so on and so forth and put him at odds. And to me, it's a great struggle. The last couple of years of Malcolm's life is something out of the Godfather and the Old Testament kind of rolled together. Uh, I, th I think it's, it, it's truly an amazing uh, story. I think he was relentlessly honest in the sense that he reinvented himself two or three times, you know, from, from, from the beginning, uh, first to, uh, to go into the nation of Islam, and, and then to, to have the courage to go against Elijah Muhammad. Um, but then his ridicule for nonviolence, he was honest enough at the end to say, look, I've always been saying, watch what happens if anybody attacks me or anybody around me, I'll show you uh, what a real man does. Uh, anybody can sit in, a real man. And, and then when he didn't do that, his trip to Selma three weeks before he died, uh, and the speech that he gave there is quite remarkable, because what he's really saying is, I apologize, I know that you're taking risks I do not want to try to tell you to do anything different. I just want the Lord to take fear out of your heart. It, it was, he was in transition. It, I think what he was saying was, I scored cheap points by ridiculing you across the wall for being nonviolent, saying that I was going to be violent, but I haven't been violent. So it's just empty rhetoric, so at least I want to say I respect what you're doing. Now, where he would have gone for that from there, I don't really know, but I think that he was really, really serious about trying to implant true Islam, which he thought had the capacity to deal with race. Now, Islam may not have the capacity to deal with a lot of other things, as the Shia Sunni, uh, he, he was not really in the Shia Sunni thing. That was uh, predated his lifetime, but it was a reality. He thought it had the capacity to deal with, with the uh, undertow uh, of race. I don't know where he would have taken that, but um, Malcolm uh, is truly um, uh, an extraordinary figure, and I think we're still... Uh, Learning, we still have things to learn uh, about it, and and I, I know his life was cut short. I, what I wish is that there was a, there was a better biography of Wallace Muhammad because I think Wallace Muhammad was Malcolm X with patience, um, and 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 yet what has happened to the fact that we have not a fifth column of terrorism in Al Qaeda in. Uh, the, African, the, the Islamic community in America is a remarkable, large, and underappreciated phenomenon in American life. And I think uh, to start with Malcolm and, 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 and understand what Wallace Muhammad did afterwards to transform the nation of Islam uh, would, would be a great service to this country. If I were, uh, if I were younger, I, I'd try to work on it. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.